today we're going to learn a little bit more about uh, bicode instrumentation, but with, from a testing perspective. May I just ask anyone, just put your hands up if anyone's actually play, um, played with BCI. Oh, fantastic. One person. Um, okay, so a little bit about me first. The, uh, so a disclaimer. So my name is, is Paul Thwaite and I work at IBM UK, uh, IBM Hursley in, um, in the United Kingdom. And my, my primary role is the quality assurance test lead uh, for Java 8. And I, I lead a team uh, across various continents across the world. And, our pri and um, when we, uh, just recently I took on the role of, um, of Open, JD Open JDK contributor from a testing perspective. Uh, those of you who've been to some Open JDK talks may have heard that we do have a problem with Open JDK in terms of not having many tests to actually run. And, and we're trying to grow the, the, the pool of tests as we speak. So that's going to be one of my roles for the next year, I'd imagine, if, if not longer than that. So what are you uh, going to get out of this, this talk? So a, little bit, a little bit more about me and why I'm doing the talk. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction of, into bytecode instrumentation. And, uh, and then we'll take it. Then we'll look at the testing aspect. Why? How can we actually use BCI to test um, the product that we're testing? And then we'll, we'll, look, we'll actually go and get onto the command line, and I'll show a few examples of how we actually do BCI. We run the, we will, we'll run a test, and then we'll run a test with BCI, and you'll see how it, how useful it can uh, can be. I'll provide an introduction to Java agents, if though, just for those who don't know what a Java agent is. Uh, BCI does use Java agents. And uh, we'll also uh, go through exactly how BCI works, the limitations, and then we'll go through a few approaches. So my, my team and I test Java. We break Java. My, do my job is to break Java. My job is to find defects in the OpenJDK. I'm sorry, well, it is an OpenJDK, but in the, in the IBM SDK. And, and my job is that when we deliver an SDK to our customers, it's of good quality. And we, we primarily focus on system testing, and so and system testing could be a talk in itself, uh, but to summarize, uh, what we tend to do is we, we look at uh, running tests at high load, so we're stressing the JVM, trying to find JIT bugs, uh, and also we concentrate on the third-party applications. So take, for example, Eclipse. We, uh, we, it, the Eclipse uh, application has a set automated test suite, and we, we, use, so we run that test suite and all its supported platforms to make sure Eclipse functions properly before that, that version of Java is shipped to our customers. And we, use, um, when we run various other uh, third-party applications, such as Derby, Scala, and so on, because we want to make sure that when the customer gets Java on day one, that it works. So the way, the way I look at system tests is that we're effectively, effectively the first customer before uh, our, the real customer gets the, uh, gets the SDK. And because Java, because it's, it's essentially we just want to throw as much Java as we can at the SDK. So why are we looking at BCI from, from, from a BCI example uh, perspective is that we, we're using BCI in test because we wanted to, to drive the different ways of, of actually um, running the tests. And BCI is actually very good at doing that. And we're going to go through a few examples of how to do that. So quickly, a, a quick introduction to bytecode instrumentation. So reading the top line, BCI is modifying the bytes of a class at runtime. So when you, when you run your JVM, uh, you, would, uh, you would run it with an agent, and we'll talk about agents a little bit later. And you can, you can uh, effectively modify classes at load time or at, at a point afterwards. So when the JVM loads, it loads classes, you can modify a class then, or you can modify it after it's been loaded. And we'll talk about the different ways of how you can modify it. There are some, there are some restrictions in terms of the classes that you can modify, such as Java Lang objects you can't do, and some security uh, classes that you can't modify. And the good news is, uh, as you'll see later, is that there are uh, abstraction frameworks available. 
one of the things that, um, that's fairly clear about, uh, well, it will be very clear, is that with BCI, you will be playing with bytecodes. And uh, there are some frameworks out there which make that a lot easier to do so. And the, the diagram at the bottom here, essentially what I was trying to re represent here is that you have a class that you've, you've created and you have some code that you want to insert into that class, but you want to do that um, at runtime. And, uh, and that's essentially what we're doing with BCI. Now, ASM is, is, a, is, a, is a brilliant product. Uh, it's used by loads of different, different um, uh, packages, uh, products out there, such as um, AspectJ uh, use it pretty well, uh, and also JRuby do. And essentially, it is the framework that, that, that we use in IBM. It provides us, provides us with the, um, the tools to, to perform BCI without having to get down into the nitty gritty of, of understanding bytecodes. And, um, and it also does, it's also got an analysis framework as well, which I haven't um, really paid much attention to. Uh, so the examples that, you'll, that I'll show you will we'll talk about, uh, we'll use ASM in some great detail. Has anyone used ASM? Fantastic. Okay, so now look at the, the, the problems that we have in test. If you imagine a, a try-catch block uh, and, you have, uh, and you're performing some function and that function may throw an exception and you need to test the code uh, in the, the, the exception catch so that you want to make sure that that code works properly, you can do that by using the... Um, by effectively using BCI. And, what, and we, we'll go through a, a concrete example of how that can be done. So you want to, if you have a, a, an exception block with three exceptions and you want to drive all four of those paths in that exception block, you can do that with BCI and you don't have to change your test. And that's why BCI is, is powerful. If let's look at memory exhaustion. If you consider a large uh, scale application uh, such as an application server, and you wanted to, uh, to an application server, you know, will have code to that that handles out of memory conditions. How do you test for that? Uh, there are so many different ways that the application server could 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 be memory exhaust, could experience memory exhaustion, and how would you test for it? It's it it, it is a, it, it's a hard thing to do, and it's very and BCI can help with that. And likewise for for secure paths uh, going through code, we, there's, there's an easy way of, of, of being able to, to encourage the, the, the flow of applicate the flow uh, to the specific method or function that you want to actually test. Who, who in the audience uh, has, is, is a, a test professional? One, two, three. I'd love to speak to you afterwards, actually. So here's, a, here's an example here where we have, a, we have four paths that we want to test. So the first one is we're, we're creating a socket and that socket will either work or it doesn't. If it does work and then we can get on with the code and we can do what, whatever we want to do with that socket. But it can also throw an unknown host exception and we need to, we need to be able to test that the code that, that um, then runs when an unknown host exception uh, is triggered, we need to be able to test that code. Likewise for an I.O. exception and a security exception. And we know this, so by looking at the socket API, so for, for the, if you're, when you're passing in a string and uh, an int into the socket uh, class, you will, you'll end up uh, that it can, it can throw three exceptions. And at the bottom of this slide here, uh, an unknown host exception, if the IP of the host could not be determined, uh, and an I.O. exception, which is um, an I.O. error uh, when, caused, when creating the socket. I.O. exception is an interesting one because it's kind of a catch-all. How, how can you create an I.O. exception uh, and, and, um, and be confident that you've caught uh, all the different possible use cases? So let's just quickly go through this example here. 
So in the first in the first here, this is the test running normally. You run the test and it creates the socket, no problems. It's found in this example, uh, W, it's, it's found, uh, it's created a socket to the domain um, example.com. And then you can go off and do whatever it is you want to do with that socket. For unknown host exception, how else could you test for an unknown host exception? You could pull the network cable out of the, uh, out of the machine and run your test and, and you can prove that it's not going to find, a, it's not going to find the, the host and therefore it will throw an unknown host exception. Certainly that's one way around it. You could, you could modify ETC host to, to ensure that, um, that it doesn't return what, what you're expecting. But it's not particularly practical. As soon as you go and change your test machine, then any other test that runs on it isn't going to be particularly, um, you can't really trust those tests. So with BCI, we, we, can, uh, we can do that. We can, uh, we can test for it. IO exception, you would need to understand the implementation of, of, the, of what it is that you're testing in order to test for an IO exception. And it's actually going to be really hard to do. How, do you, how, would you, would you, how would you intercept the connection in order to try and cause an IO exception? So, and, and again, it's not particularly practical. The security exception is an interesting one because here you have to create a security manager in, uh, in order to, um, to actually test this, this particular function, this particular exception rather. And it, it, it could be complicated to set up and essentially, at the end of the day, it might be best that you have two tests anyway to, to test for both, um, both conditions. So now I'm going to show you a demo on the command line to, to prove the point here. So this, t this test, what this test does, it, well, it creates a socket for three hosts. And the hosts are ibm.com, oracle.com, and example.com. If the socket connection was successful, it'll print it's successful, and, it'll, and likewise if not. When, BC, when the test is run with BCI, uh, there's a trigger in the, in the BCI uh, agent which, uh, which effectively says, if the host that, that I'm about to create a socket for is oracle.com, don't create the socket, just throw an unknown host exception instead. And at that point, the code, under, the code for the uh, unknown host exception could then be run and therefore tested. Looking at the, the, the Java command for test one, this is just a test running as normal. And, it's, and it's, it's a very simple test, as you can see from the description. The test two, the, uh, the test is running with BCI. The, the command line um, will, I'll go into in greater detail after, the, after I've done the demo. The bot I want to point out here is the, uh, the text in blue, the um, oracle.com. What I'm passing in here is a, is a host. So I can control the agent, that's, I can control what's actually what host to, uh, to throw the unknown host exception on. So I'm just going to go back down to the command line and we'll, I'll show you how this works. So this is the this is the test running uh, on its as as it should do with um, with no BCI. It's extremely um, basic. Um, so it, it's tried to connect to example Oracle and ibm.com and it's worked. So the so the uh, there are uh, try catch blocks in the test, um, but the code for those try try catch blocks haven't been exercised because the test passed. So we've not been able to test those, um, the, the, the code in the try-catch blocks. So now let's run the, let's run the test with, with BCI enabled. And what we're doing here is we're telling the, we're telling, we're telling, we're telling the JVM to load, to enable the BCI agent. And uh, when the socket class gets loaded, and the, uh, we, we're effectively modifying the socket class uh, to it's actually we're modifying the, the constructor for the socket class to allow, um, writing, I'll, I'll, explain to, I'll explain to a second, exactly what I'm in a second. So here, we have, uh, we've connected to our example.com, that's fine. Oracle.com didn't work because um, we've effectively thrown an unknown host exception. 
and, and, and IBMCloud.com was fine. Going back to the slides, for those who couldn't see the, uh, the screen properly, uh, we did the, the output from, from test one, everything was good, and we threw an unknown host exception for oracle.com. So this is a breakdown of the command line that we've just run. The, the boot class path is required for, for some classes that you want to, to change uh, at runtime. And it really depends on which classes you're trying to, you're trying to change. If, you're, if it's an application class, then you won't need to use the boot class path. If you're trying to change uh, some of the system classes, such as java.net socket, uh, you, the JVM will not let you do that unless you've added uh, your, all your classes to the class path. So you'll see here that we've got the ASM library and we've also got in green, this is, the, um, this is effectively our BCI agents, which is uh, been packaged in a jar. We're running a Java agent uh, with that, um, which contains our, our, our BCI agent, and we're passing in as an option uh, the, uh, the host oracle.com. The test itself hasn't changed, so the point here is we're not changing the test at all. One of the advantages of BCI is that we don't want to change the test. The point is you want the test to, to be on, a, a single, on its own, and we will change the environment which the test runs in in order to, to drive certain paths through, through code. So let's take a different example using memory exhaustion. I, before I mentioned that there was a, um, a, an example of, of an out-of-memory error, and an out-of-memory error is very hard to to predict when that's going to happen, and when it does happen, how do you uh, how do you how do you test the code that's supposed to run when it does? If you imagine a massive, uh, a big scale, complex, a, a, a huge complex system, where an out of memory could happen as anywhere, anywhere within the system, how do you do it? You can do it with BCI. I should also say on here that, that sometimes you may want to look at. It's possible that you may want to reduce the heap. To so reduce the heap, therefore, it may have thrown out a memory exception. Fine, that might work. But it's not going to work for every possible combination within, the, within your application. And also, the, the point here is also that you, if you're trying to reduce the heap of your application server, your application server may not actually function anyway because it's not going to work very well. So in this, in this demo here, we are creating, we need, we're filling the heap, and in the first instance with the test running as normal, we're adding integers to the heap. And the, 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 uh, an out of memory exception would be thrown once we filled the heap. But given that we're just adding integers, it'll take a long time for that to happen. It probably would be continuing to run at Java 2013. So how do we, how do we test, how do we force the out of memory exception? We do that uh, by, by using BCI, and we, we set a trigger so that after three integers have been loaded into the heap, throw an out-of-memory exception, and then you can test your out-of-memory exception handling code. Uh, looking at test one, uh, this is the, the standard test, and uh, test two, this is where we've enabled the BCI agent, and we're passing in the, the, the number three, so we're saying to the agent, after the third integer that's been loaded, thrown out of memory, exception. Right, let's go to the... Uh... So in this example here, we're running the test, and the test will, every time uh, it prints a, a, an item to the screen, it's loading an integer. It's not particularly exciting, but it's just there to prove a point. And this will carry on and, and, until the, the heap's filled up, which we, we, we can't wait for that. So, we, um, so I'm just going to kill it, because it's, it's pointless. I'm going to try and kill it. Okay. 
So now we run the, the demo with, with BCI, and what we're, telling, what we're doing here is we're loading it with the BCI agent, and we're, we're saying that uh, when the, the third integer is loaded, throw an outer memory exception. So it should go happen now. So also this this now therefore allows us to test uh, our outer, uh, the the code that would typically run when we, an outer memory would happen. And you can't predict when an outer memory when an outer memory is to happen in the machine. And I I, I appreciate that that depending on the the state of your environment, it may not be possible to recover from one. But let but let's assume that that it's 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 it, it's possible. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. This is just the output if you haven't seen it. I think the screen's pretty good, so I'll move on. So a breakdown of the command. Uh, we're not using the, the, the boot class path this time because we don't need to use it. The, uh, it's be because the classes that we're transforming our application classes and we're not actually changing any SDK classes or any of the classes that require uh, the boot class path. And we're adding, we're, add, we're passing in an option three into the, um, the, into the agent. The ASM class libraries are also, ASM libraries are also added to the class path and we're running the test. And the test, <coughs> excuse me, hasn't actually changed. So let's just recap on what, we, what, what BCI is. So sometimes it's hard to test parts of the application, and uh, BCI does provide a solution for that. BCI uh, does have some restrictions, and when you are when you, when you're playing with BCI, uh, essentially you can replace uh, method bodies. So you can't replace a method, you can't remove a method, uh, uh, but you can replace the contents of a method. You can, uh, you can replace your entire class, and we'll go into that a bit later. Sorry, I can't hear you. If, it, if that's OK, is it? Yeah. So you, can replace, so you can replace your entire class. And the point, and the, the, the best thing about this is you're not changing your code. You change, your code remains the same, and you're, you're, you're manipulating uh, the the environment at runtime. When we do BCI, we are actually inserting bytecodes into the application at runtime. So we, we are playing with bytecodes. Using the unknown host exception, there are two ways to do this. We could, we could change the test. We could create another version of the test, uh, uh, in this case, uh, my socket class, and, we, and, um, and so effectively kind of a mock object or we could uh, modify java.net socket, uh, the socket class, which is what we're doing here. Whichever, way you ch whichever uh, option you choose, you will uh, be playing with bytecodes. However, it's, it's actually okay because there are tools available for us to, uh, to be able to, there are tools available which allow us to, to do this. So a, qu a quick uh, update on Java agents. My apologies for those who know what, what, what one is. The, a Java agent, uh, so it BCI, BCI needs, it needs the Java agent, uses the, the, Java ag the Java agent to be able to do BCI. And this here, it, it, the code here is, the, is a typical agent. It must have a pre-main method. And the, the, the agent is, is added into a jar file. In the jar file, you create the manifest, and you effectively create, you're pointing the manifest to the, the class in, your, in, in the, the jar file, which, can, which is your agent. So when you're doing BCI, all the classes that do all the transformations will end up in this, in this jar, including your agent. And so the, the agent, the, the, the JVM doesn't know which, what, which class is gonna, it contains your pre-main method. So you're, doing, you're, you're setting that by updating the manifest for the jar file. 
The, when you're running an agent, it's, it, it behaves like any other Java code. So you don't, it, it doesn't have any special, uh, uh, nothing special about it. It can do anything that any other Java code can do. And actually that's what makes it quite powerful. The instrumentation object in the example here is, is what actually does the, does the transformation when you're, when you're performing BCI. So how does BCI actually work? I, I pondered how best to describe this because I could, I could display loads of, loads of uh, Java code on the screen and it was a little bit complicated so I thought I'd go to diagrams instead. I do have uh, examples available if anyone wants to, to see them, we'll take them away with them. The examples that I showed you today, you can take them. But I decided to go, to go with, uh, with this instead because it was just easier to, 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 um, to put on the screen. So we're using, we're using the example of the unknown host exception. And we have our socket class. We have our ASM library. And ASM uh, implements a visitor API. So it, and and we'll, we'll talk about how that, all that works in a second. So the JVM has loaded. And it's loaded the socket class. And uh, in our agent, we're effectively saying, OK, one, once you've loaded class socket, now let's go, in, now let's go in, um, and, and look through this class and, tr and try and find the method that we want to change. So we start off and we've, we've uh, so we found the socket class, we found socket and the, with uh, the constructor, I, so the constructor inet address and we go to our visitor method. Is this the target method that we want? to change? No, it's not. Because we, we, we want to change string host and port. So it ignores it, and it, and, and it, will, well, it goes back to the then It ignores it, writes the bytes for that particular method, and, go, and then we go to the next one in the, cl in the class. Here, we, so we, here we've got the, the, the actual uh, constructor that we actually want. This is what we're changing. And we ask the question again, is this the target method? Yes, it is. So here, in visit code, which is uh, an ASM uh, method, uh, we, we can actually insert the bytecodes for, the, uh, for the, um, the code that we want to run. And, and the, the code that we do, we actually are inserting, is this. You may not be able to read that. Yeah. So all we're doing is we're saying, so in the socket class, for this particular constructor, uh, we're saying, instead of doing all the stuff that you're doing, just throw, if the host is this, throw a, a, an exception, an unknown host exception. Now, what this means for ASM is that uh, this code translates to, uh, to, to these bytecodes. So when you play with ASM, uh, this is what you would end up having to do. Now, if, for those of you who haven't seen this, this uh, notation before, excuse me, I don't find it particularly useful and particularly um, great. And there, are, there is a tool which I'll talk about later which allows us to create this code for us. And essentially, this is the code that actually replaces the, the code. Uh, it does the bike. This is the bike code instrumentation. In fact, this is essentially saying, put this code in this <coughs> method and then write it back, and then the JVM will be using that code as opposed to the previous version. And what it, and then ASM will do that, and what it effectively translates to is these bytecodes. And this is, um, this is, like, this is output from um, Java P. In terms of uh, limitations, The, the, the biggest thing, you, you, you cannot uh, change a field. I, I did, when I was first playing with this, I was trying to, trying to, to uh, change a field. And it kept complaining, and I couldn't work out why. And it realized that it was, ju it was just, it, it's a limitation. You can't change fields, or add the, you, you can't you know, add or remove the fields. Um, methods um, can, can also can't be added or removed. 
but you can change the actual uh, contents of the methods. Uh, method signatures uh, can't be modified. So if we go to the example back here, uh, where we have string, host, and ports, if we try and change that, it will the, the JVM will let us. As I've said before, most classes can be modified, including um, most SDK classes, but Java Lang objects is one where you can't, and some security classes can't be modified. So, BCI options. We said before that, that you, there are different ways of doing this. You can replace the method body, or you can replace an entire class. I prefer this method because you don't need to play with any bytecodes at all. And it's, it's, it's so essentially, if you want to uh, replace a class foo with boo, uh, you, would, you would compile, you create both classes, and you compile them. When you, when you uh, so the, 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 the boo class is available on the class path, and when you load the JVM and you've started your BCI agent, you can effectively say, is the, it, when, it, when the agent, when the JVM is loading all the classes, you can go through each of these classes, say, is this the class that I want to change? No, and it will go to the next one. Once you've found the class you want to change, you're effectively given a byte array, which represents the class. Instead of using that byte array, you can throw that away and read in your new class, convert it to a byte array, and return that back to the JVM. And effectively, you, you just remove, you just replace the class. So the, the advantage of this is that you don't need to understand bytecode, uh, but there are some, some limitations, and the kind of obvious really is that you, the, the source code must be available uh, and un, un, unchanged and um, it has to be the same compiler version. I, uh, this is, this is the, the, the method that I prefer the, the, the best because you're effectively, uh, it's, it's easier than, than playing with bytecodes. So there are many BCI frameworks available. Uh, I think that, and ASM, I believe, is the best one. The, it does provide the, the abstraction layer that I think we need. I think we find that, um, that it, if, you're, if you're playing with it, you're getting down to nitty gritty bytecodes, it's, it's just not particularly fun for me anyway. Um, and it, 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 um, it, the only other thing I will say is that it is providing an extra dependency onto, on your application, um, but I think it's worth it. The, uh, if you go to the ASM website, there's loads of examples and, and, and tutorials on how to use it. I, I haven't gone into detail here on how to use it specifically, uh, but I, at the end of the presentation there are some um, uh, references that you can go and, and, and do that. One thing that, um, that's clear about BCI is that you, you, you do kind of need to know the JVM architecture a little bit. You need to understand how the JVM loads classes in, and, and in order to be able to perform bytecode instrumentation, and uh, there's a, there's a link to the to, to the um, to, to the JVM spec for you to read if you really want to. Another way of, of generating bytecodes is to use Java P. So you've you've created your class, and you have uh, and you can put that through Java P using the minus V option. And then you can get your then you can get your bytecodes uh, listed there, and then you can use those to uh, to put into the class that actually performs the bytecode instrumentation. It's a bit messy, but it's certainly one way of doing it. This this I think is one of the best best things that the ASM has provided. And it's, uh, it's an Eclipse plugin, and it's called ASM, ASMifier. And it allows you to, to uh, if you wanted to uh, replace the method body, and you wanted to, to turn the contents of that method body into ASM logic, which is what we've listed here, you could do that by hand, uh, or you could use the ASM fire tool. And all that does is that it recreates, you, 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 you install the plugin, and you, uh, you open up the, the um, I think it's, it's called bytecode uh, perspective or the, the bytecode view in Eclipse. Click on 
a method in your class and then in, it'll open up a window and it'll give you effectively, it'll print this code out. I, some of this is, there, there is additional code that it gets that it does get printed out and that's where you, a little bit of expertise is going to be needed because you need to understand what to, what to ignore and what not to ignore. But the ASM uh, manual provides all that information. Has anyone used ASM before? How did you, was it good? So what can, what can go wrong? The, this slide really was for, 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 you, for, you to, for you to take away because when you start playing with this, um, it, it won't necessarily go, um, won't go perfect from day one. The, um, if, the, if the JVM is unhappy uh, with the class, you'll get a, a, a Java line verify error. That's potentially what I, what I used to tend to get a lot of the time. The, um, what else do we have? So the, when you, um, typically there are three areas here. So a stack shape inconsistent, um, so underflow error. Um, one of the things that I find is that, that in the uh, tutorials they do go through a lot of these uh, examples. And you'd also notice that, um, that if you're using ASM, ASM will do a lot of this work for you anyway. So I do, I do encourage you to, to go down the ASM route or an equivalent um, uh, a framework. So you need to be aware that there isn't any, any compile time checking. Uh, and also that, that, that if you're trying to call a private method, um, it can it, fail, it fails at runtime, and it's essentially, if you're trying to use incorrect arguments into methods, um, or the ordering, or indeed typos, it's kind of you know fairly self-explanatory. So, in, in conclusion, the I, I find BCI is extremely powerful. <coughs> it, it is used in many many products uh, available um, out there at the moment, and um, and JVM knowledge is required. But I think that. If you take advantage of the ASM, if the tools available such as ASM, then it, you can actually be quite a powerful way of doing testing. And we in IBM, we use this uh, to, to perform our tests, to perform testing because we find it very useful. Uh, the, the slides are available on, the, on SlideShare, but they will be after the conference. And I do have the example code if you, if you want that as well. Um, please just email me at the address below. And um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.